The research paper I want to talk about is peer effects in product adoption. And this is joint work with Johannes, who's also here, uh, Mike Bailey at Facebook, Drew Johnston, and Arlene Wong. So this project was motivated by the idea that peer effects are um, likely to be important driver of product adoption decisions. But um, this comes back to what I mentioned, we don't actually know much about the specific nature or details of many of these peer effects, but it turns out that they are very central to the implications of peer, peer effects. For instance, in this space, when we see peer-induced purchases, is this extra demand or is it retiming of future demand? If it's extra demand, then firms or like the regulator might care a lot. If it's just short-term retiming, then maybe in aggregate, it just doesn't have a big effect. Who are the most influential individuals? And also, does this correlate, and if so, with price sensitivity? Because that might tell us about optimal pricing at the margin. And finally, are PFX concentrated on the product purchased by friends or are there positive or negative spillovers to competing products? For instance, if I buy a phone, if I buy a new iPhone, does this mostly lead to new phone purchases overall or does it really mostly lead to iPhone purchases where maybe these people would have bought a new phone anyways and now they're changing their model? As I've hinted at, this project is going to explore these questions in the market for phone purchases. Measurement challenge and identification. How are we going to solve them? Well, measurement challenge is that we need both the peer and the peer's product adoption decisions in the same data set. What we're going to use here is we're going to use anonymized data from Facebook to measure the peers, who your Facebook friends are, this will be our peer group, as well as the product adoption. This is coming from the fact that when people log in on their mobile phone into the app, we get, um, we get a record of which type of phone they are using. And so we can see when someone switches their phone, which means we think they're getting a new phone. Second part is identification. Well, clearly there's homophily in who you are Facebook friends with. And so we worry about common shocks and common preferences. Therefore, we can't just look at correlated behavior and call that a peer effect. The way we overcome this identification challenge is by exploiting quasi-random variation in peers purchasing a phone. So this is the second method endogenous network and a shock. What is my shock? My main shock will be a friend who breaks or loses their phone. That is um, kind of random. I don't plan to lose or break my phone. And so I can see when so that happens to a friend, how does the subsequent purchase affect her friends, trace that shock through the network. A second related um, identification strategy is the idea of contract renewals, that people are due for contract renewals after two years, and the timing of that is somewhat random. Okay, data. As I mentioned, it's anonymized network data from Facebook. The information we have is for mobile active users, and when these users log into the mobile app, the app registers their phone model and their carrier. So this is how we know which phone you log in from. And this is how we identify switches to new phones. We're gonna do all this in um, a person week observations for four weeks um, pooled across them in 2016. The main thing to really only know about this um, sample horizon is that it is not close to a major device release or a major shopping holiday. So it doesn't include like Black Friday or the release of a new iPhone. So our baseline research question is, are people more likely to buy any new phone if their friend recently bought a new phone? That is, I want to regress whether someone buys a phone on her friends buying a phone. As I mentioned, my identification challenge comes from homophily, that I think people have both correlated preferences and are potentially exposed to correlated shocks. So what we need to do and what we're trying to do is we need to find an instrument for the number of friends who buy phones. That, and this is just a definition of an instrument, quasi-randomly shifts the probability of friends buying, but does not affect the individual's probability of buying 
except through the peer effects. And so what we're going to use is random phone loss. What is random phone loss? We use public posts on Facebook that signal that a person lost their phone in a way that is random. For instance, um, this post here where the person wrote, well, my iPhone took a tumble today and the screen shattered. So naturally, I'm now the proud owner of an iPhone X. This person is explicitly telling us that they um, dropped their phone, the screen shattered, and therefore they got a new phone. We actually see that they got a new phone, but now we know that this new phone was due to such a random phone loss. How do we identify these posts? We can't possibly read through all of them. And so to identify these posts, we use a, our approach is to use a combination of word embeddings, which turns these posts into in some sense numbers that you can then use a machine learning algorithm, namely a convolution neural network on. This is trained on uh, 15,000 hand classified posts. And it takes um, advantage relative to what you would, could maybe alternatively use a regular expression search is that this machine learning approach removes some false positives. For instance, this post. So I dropped my phone in the toilet yesterday. You surprise how often that is specified. Still works though. So this person dropped their phone, but it works. So this would be a false positive if you had just looked for a dropped phone. This phone still works, so it didn't actually break. It also allows us po to identify posts that would otherwise be hard to pick up, such as this one. Long story short, my phone tried to light my house on fire last night and you'll have to reach me on here for a while. Clearly this person's phone died for whatever reason um, and so they have no phone for now, but that would have been very hard to pick up in a regular expression search. Overall, with this method, we identify about 330,000 posts about random phone loss. So once we have this post, that's basically our first stage. We are now looking at whether we see a first stage, do people buy new phones after dropping um, their phone? You see this here on the timeline. So point zero is the week that this friend posted and we see the people who posted about random phone loss, people who posted about something else, or people who didn't post. And in the pre-period, these three lines lie nicely on top of each other. In the week and a little bit in the week after that someone posts about a random phone loss, there's a spike. These people are much, much more likely now to get a new phone. And then it dies down again. And so that's our first stage. That's going to be our instrument. The fact that a random phone loss induces new phone purchases. The second instrument that we're going to use is the contract renewal idea. So what you see here is the age of the phone in days and versus the probability of buying a new phone. And that dark gray spike that you see, this is when the phone turns exactly two years old. We know that a lot of um, companies allow people to upgrade their phone after two years. So then they get a new phone and we see this spike. Importantly, if we split this up by the carrier, you can see that these spikes at two years only exist for a few carriers, namely Verizon and Sprint. Compare this to say T-Mobile, which is a magenta colored um, line that goes up and down, but it's basically flat through these two years. And so what we're going to use as an instrument is the number of friends who are up for contract renewal with um, Verizon or Sprint, controlling for the total number of friends you have with two-year-old phones, as well as the total number of friends you have with Verizon and Sprint. Okay, so now we have our identification with our measurement. Now we can run regressions. We're going to regress whether someone buys a new phone on how many of her friends recently bought a new phone. Importantly, we need to include a bunch of controls. And so we control for fixed characteristics of the user. We want to only compare users who are similar. So we need to include an interaction of the user's age, her gender, her education, where she lives, her state, and the week where we observe them. We're also going to control um, very tightly for device to compare people of the same device right now. So we're going to control for the exact device with the same carrier 
roughly the, of the same age and again weak. And finally, we control for the friend network. And so we're going to include the number of friends times the number of friends that switched phones in the last six months. That's kind of capturing fixed effects of the network. And so these three allow us to compare very similar users who have basically the same devices and have comparable friendship networks. In addition, we have linear controls for an own for the own individual um, predicted probability of buying a new phone, for average purchase probability among friends, for individual and friend posting behavior when we use the random phone loss instrument, and for um, the number of friends with all the carriers when we use the contract renewal instrument. So here's our regression equation. Here are the estimates. First, the all S and then the second stage IV for the broken phone and the contract threshold instruments where the first stages are what I showed you earlier. What we find is that when a friend buys a phone, the probability that the individual buys a phone the subsequent week goes up by uh, four basis points, so 0 0.04 percentage points. We, um, I want to mention that this effect is not driven by family members. We can exclude them and it also is not driven by advertising. One thing that sticks out here is that the OLS and the IV are all of very similar comparable magnitudes. So kind of three basis points for the OLS, four for the broken phone and 2.6 for the contact threshold instrument. So one question is, well, if we thought that homophily and um, common shocks are very important, then we should have expected that the IV is smaller than the OLS because it filters out all of these. So why do we see these relative um, similar estimates? Or well, one possible explanation is that we have very tight controls. And so conditional on the controls, the exact timing of when you get a phone is maybe less driven by common preferences and common shocks than by really truly the peer, peer effects. And so already in the OLS, we are not we're controlling away a lot of this homophily and um, common preferences. But also to be honest, um, there are just different um, Marginal effects that the IV and the OLS identify, they identify off of different individuals. And so when we have heterogeneity in the treatment effect, we can simply get very different results based on which population we are identifying off. So do we see heterogeneity in the treatment effect? What we see here is close versus distant friends. And there's a big difference. Close friends have a much stronger peer effect. We can also look at heterogeneity by own characteristics. What jumps out here is that there's not very much except for the number of friends. Um, so people, you know, having more friends means that you, each friend Lou is less close on average and so you're less um, influenced by them. Heterogeneity by friend characteristics, we see more heterogeneity here, so younger or less educated people are more influential. And again, we see differences by friend numbers. So there seems to be a lot of heterogeneity and it's definitely plausible that we are just identifying different lates. Another very specific form of heterogeneity I want to mention is the um, implications for demand. So, and remember that we talked about how can we go beyond documenting peer effects. Here's one way that we think is interesting. If you think about whether peer effects matter for price setting, then it really matters whether the marginal peer that you're pricing at is has strong peer effects or not. So if the most price elastic individuals are also the ones with high peer influence, then by raising my prices and losing this most price sensitive individual, I'm also losing the substantial knock on peer effects. On the other hand, if the most price sensitive person is not, doesn't have very strong peer effects, I only lose that individual, but very little in knock on peer effects. What we find in our setting is that we indeed find a strong correlation between price elasticity and peer influence of um, 
How do we get that? Well, P influence we estimate with our method here. Individual price elasticity for different types of groups we get by looking at um, purchasing following a price cut of the iPhone 6 in 2016. But what this means is that these large P effects of the most price elastic individuals mean that aggregate and individual price elasticities diverge, that they are very different because at the margin there are very strong P effects. And Ceterpris Paribus, this would lead to lower prices because I'm not just losing the one marginal customer, I'm also losing all the knock on P effects that tend to be um, high. So, what I showed you is that people are more likely to buy a phone the next week when they, their friends recently bought a new phone. So now we wanna ask, is this really new demand or just are we just re-timing demand? Are we pulling demand forward? Are these purchases that would have happened eventually anyways? Well, here we're tracing out our treatment effect. The vertical line you see here is when um, the peer broke their phone. You can see nicely that there's absolutely no pre-trend. So in the weeks before, there's no differential um, phone purchasing behavior of her friends. You can basically think of this as like placebo effects. We don't expect to see anything there. We don't see anything. So that means um, we're good with our specification. Then afterwards, we see an increased probability of the friend purchasing a phone. It's, mo it's highest in the couple of weeks right after the friend originally bought the phone. And then it goes down a little bit, but it doesn't fully die out until um, like more than 45 weeks later. So we see really no evidence of a reversal over the first 10 months. If it was retiming, we should see that we see purchases move forward. So we see a positive effect early on, but then these missing purchases later on, we just don't see that at least on, on net. Um, on net, this leads to new purchases rather than uh, retiming. And what does this mean? Well, it means that for a firm, the value of a new customer is pretty high because you're gonna have these high knock on purchases from peer effects, which are not just retiming. Okay, so, so far we've seen the effect of friends purchasing any type of phone. Now we wanna look at the specific type of phone. If I buy an, buy an iPhone, do my friends buy an iPhone as well or do they buy any other type of phone like a Samsung Galaxy? So conceptually I have two things. I have the people who are now newly encouraged to buy a phone, which one do they buy? But also I might have some friends who would have bought a phone anyways, but I convinced them now to buy the same brand that I uh, bought. We still have our common shocks and homophily problem. So we need to find a way to now find an instrument, not just for a friend buying any type of phone, but for a friend buying an iPhone or buying a Galaxy. And so here, the idea that we're using is this observation that people differ in their propensity to buy particular types of phones. So some people just are um, oh, Apple aficionados and they will always buy an iPhone. Some people hate big tech and they will never buy one of the big phones. They will always buy from a smaller person. And so the identification strat idea is that if I have two people with the comparable networks, then if I pick one person in each network to lose their phone, it might be that in one network, I pick the Apple aficionado and in the other one, I pick the big tech hater. And so the person, despite the fact that they have very similar networks. The person where the random friend who lost their phone is the Apple aficionado is much more likely to have a friend who buys an iPhone relative to the other person, even though their networks are completely comparable. You see the somophily here. So we, here we have the own predicted probability um, that someone buys an iPhone relative to that a friend um, who lost their phone buys an iPhone. But once we condition, uh, on the composition of the network. Once we say, well, let's compare people who have different networks, then the probability that the friend who lost their phone buys the iPhone is flat, is not related to this person's own characteristics, and so we can use it as an instrument. Basically, it's saying it's not just random, 
whether or not a friend loses their phone, it's also random which of your friends loses their phone, whether it is the Apple Aficionado or the Samsung fan or the big tech um, skeptic. Okay, so this is what we're going to use as our instrument. And now we can look at results. So what I have here, I have now different types of outcomes. Instead of looking just at the purchases of any phone, which I still have here in my last column, I can look at the purchases of iPhone, Galaxy, and other. Previously, my exploratory variable, my regressor, was the total number of friends who bought new phones. Now I'm going to split that up into the people who bought new iPhones, the people who bought Galaxies, and the people who bought other type of phones. I'm going to use the instrument that I just outlaid to instrument for all three of these. So what do we find? The first thing that stands out is that we have these big estimates on the diagonal. So the largest effect of buying an iPhone, a Galaxy, another type of phone is on purchases of this same brand. It's the smallest for iPhones, but generally this diagonal, the same brand effect is much, much bigger than the other effects. See here the other effects between iPhones and the Galaxy as well as the other smaller brands, we see these negative um, estimates. And so that means that the diagonal effect is slightly bigger than actually the effect of buying any type of phone. So in short, if I buy a new iPhone, this will lead to mostly new iPhone purchases. A large fraction of that, which I see in the last column, is new phones, but there are some friends who would have bought some of these other phones who are now discouraged from buying these other phones and will buy iPhones instead. On um, what does this mean? It means that if I lose a customer to a rival firm, I am also going to lose more than just that customer because this person will pull some of her peers to buy the other brands as well. And I see this especially strongly between iOS versus Android phones. Finally, if I just look at the um, galaxies versus other types of phones, I actually see some positive across brand spillovers. And so this might be that um, this is just generally about Android phones. If I buy a Galaxy, I make my friends more likely to also move away from the iPhone to buy an Android phone rather than stick with um, Apple. Okay. The last thing I want to mention is that now we've done it with brands, we could in principle also do this with um, the specific phone model. The big challenge we're facing here is that we simply don't have a good way of shifting whether someone buys an iPhone 6S or whether someone buys an iPhone 6. These are just too correlated. And so we can't do an IV strategy here, we have to go with the OLS. So keep all those caveats in mind. But when we do this, what we see is this really most of those peer effects are concentrated on the exact same model. Um, compare this to um, the same brand, different model, it's really mostly people buying the exact same phones as their friends. Finally, um, a little bit of heterogeneity here, um, just the first graph is by the price of the model. And so we don't see any difference systematically with regard to price. So we see similarly on average size PFX for $200 phones than for like $800 phones. The interesting thing, however, is if we look at by how long it was since that phone hit the market, we see much stronger P effects early on in the weeks or days um, after a phone first hits the market. And I think all of that taken together hints at that people seem to be really kind of learning about those phones from their peers. They buy the exact same model. They do this more when the phone is new. It's relatively independent of the price. And we also see positive within operating system, but negative across operating system. Um, uh, complementarities. And so all of that taken together just looks like people are really gathering information and learning about the specifics of that phone from their peers. Okay, 
let me conclude on this part. Um, people are more likely to buy new phones when their friends recently bought new phones. Um, it's mostly concentrated on the same brand and same device. And there are some interesting heterogeneities in terms of who is influential and the implications for the value of customers as well as price setting implications.